Hello friends, this is Father Matthias Dalen from Encounter Ministries. Our Encounter School of Ministry exists to teach, equip, and activate disciples to demonstrate the love of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm excited to announce that Encounter is now offering two-day weekend schools so that your communities can experience greater transformation to minister in the power of the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of God. These weekend schools happen at no cost to the host church or ministry and can help create a critical mass to fuel evangelization and renewal through the Holy Spirit. Right now, we're discerning and taking invitations from church leaders to host weekend events for this year. To learn more about our weekend schools and how to request one at your church, please follow the link in the description. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I talk to many faithful Catholics about signs, wonders, miracles, and healings, everyone believes that yes, the supernatural was happening in the life of Jesus. Yes, the demonstrations, miracles, and healings were happening in the apostles and in the early church. But what about after the early church? What about now? The prevailing belief I see present in most people is that the supernatural element of signs, wonders, and miracles, for whatever reason, either were uncommon and insignificant in the church's history, or they just faded away and were no longer needed as time went on. As new reports of supernatural signs, wonders, miracles, and healings are rising in greater frequency, often through very ordinary people, many faithful Christians are asking the question, is this real? Didn't these things stop happening? The answer is no. The truth is that over 2,000 years, God has not stopped raising up holy men and women of God who have had life-changing personal encounters with Jesus. Saints who have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Saints who have walked with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, doing the works of Jesus and greater works. Saints who have advanced the kingdom of God in their time. Saints who provide an example of what normal Christianity looks like. I want to take you on a journey to discover these supernatural saints. Join me as we learn what we can from their life in the Holy Spirit from their mission and ministry as we seek to partner with the Holy Spirit to advance the kingdom of God in our time. God poured out in an anointing and a grace upon their life that changed the world. We need the grace they had now more than ever. My name is Patrick Rice and I invite you to join me to discover, receive from, and go on mission with the supernatural saints.
The gospel is good news, and it's too good to keep to ourselves. The church calls us to proclaim the gospel through a supernatural lifestyle of faith that demonstrates the goodness of God. But you know what? For most disciples, a supernatural lifestyle isn't something normal. In fact, for a lot of people, there's a huge gap between the stories of Scripture and the lives of the saints and their actual life. And deep down, if you know that Jesus Christ didn't die for a powerless church, and you're looking for the more that's promised by God, then the Encounter School of Ministry is going to radically renew your mind and transform your life. The Encounter School of Ministry is a part-time, two-year training school for disciples who believe that God calls Christians to demonstrate His supernatural love in ministry, the marketplace, and in their families. ESM will train, equip, and activate you in the supernatural gifts Jesus modeled and intended to be part of the normal life of every disciple. Our school, rooted in Catholic teaching, scripture, and tradition, provides Christians from all backgrounds with practical training and hands-on experience of actually doing the works of Jesus. From our joyful classroom environment, we provide a safe space for you to learn, discern, and take risks in developing your gifting, calling, and confidence in stepping out in faith. The Encounter School of Ministry has three key components that you'll find in each class. The first is worship. We believe that childlike worship is one of the ways by which we respond to God's goodness and cultivate our awareness of His presence in our life. The second key component is teaching. Each session centers on transformational teaching where students learn to think with Jesus and allow the Holy Spirit to renew their minds to bring the promises of heaven to the problems of earth. Our final component is activation. We use activations as powerful spiritual exercises that take theory and put it into practice. In other words, activations help students to personally experience the theological truths taught in class, which increase our anticipation and expectation of what God can do through us. Now, whether it's training you in healing the sick, power evangelization, prophetic ministry, or equipping you with tools for inner healing and deliverance, ESM's curriculum is rooted in you renewing your identity, experiencing deep intimacy in prayer, and exploring the riches of the inheritance Jesus won for you as a son or daughter of God. Our mission is to teach, activate, and deploy disciples to be able to demonstrate the supernatural power and love of the kingdom of God in their spheres of influence. We believe that the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is active today and wants to work through you. If you believe that the gospel is too good to keep to yourself, then it's time to learn how to live a whole lifestyle that manifests the goodness of God in the world. You are about to see a miracle. This man is Willie. These people with their hands on him 
are street evangelizers. That's where they found Willie, on the street, in pain, in a wheelchair, unemployed, without hope. You see, Willie has cancer and is bound to his wheelchair. But you are about to see a miracle. Look at his face. That's the look of chronic pain leaving his body. He felt a strange surge of strength enter his body. He was able to stand up and embrace those around him. This is the first time Willie has walked in seven years. Seven years. A week after this event, he went to the doctor and the cancer was in remission without any scientific reason. In the days that followed, it was reported that Willie was able to walk without any support and his life was changed forever. Did you see the miracle? When I saw Willie get up from his wheelchair, to me that wasn't the miracle. Do you see what I see? That is a rosary around his wrist. That is the Eucharistic monstrance they are taking Willie to. For me, the real miracle wasn't that Willie was healed. It was that the people who prayed for him to be healed were Catholic. That Willie was healed by Catholics in a Catholic church. You see, I'm a cradle Catholic, and growing up Catholic, I know that most Catholics believe that miracles, healing, signs, and wonders happen only in the Bible, and occasionally through the most holy of saints, but usually only after they were dead. That apart from the sacraments, we shouldn't expect to see miracles very much. And we certainly shouldn't expect for miracles to happen through the hands of ordinary Catholics. But then, Willie, healed by Catholics. My name is Maura Smith. I am a Catholic and veteran documentarian who has hunted down stories and covered issues all over the world for the BBC, Paramount Communications, 20th Century Fox. Most currently, I've been making movies that have inspired me about my faith. We are living in a time when the church is not only under attack, but countless numbers are leaving and looking for God in other places. Something needs to change. Now more than ever, we need the Holy Spirit to come alive in power. In his apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium, Pope Francis called the church to raise up a new breed of evangelists that he referred to as spirit-filled evangelizers. The Holy Father said, Spirit-filled evangelizers are fearlessly open to the working of the Holy Spirit. The goal of this documentary is simple. I wanted to learn what it means to be fearlessly open to the Holy Spirit in evangelization and to find people in the church who are living out Pope Francis's call to be fearless. My journey started with going to talk with Dr. Ralph Martin and Dr. Mary Healy at Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan. Dr. Ralph Martin is a professor of theology and was appointed to the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization, and he is also the president of Renewal Ministries. Dr. Mary Healy is also a professor at the seminary and was appointed by Pope Francis to the Pontifical Biblical Commission. Well, I think it really all goes back to the day of Pentecost, really. I, mean, I think if we would just look closely at what happened the day of Pentecost, we discover so many things that would be so relevant for the life of Catholics in the church today. Because when the Holy Spirit came on, on the disciples on the day of Pentecost, they had the door locked, remember? They, they were afraid. So what, what does it mean to become fearless? It means to kind of really surrender yourself to the person of Jesus Christ, to obey him, to listen to his teaching about the Holy Spirit, to desire the Holy Spirit, and then to pray fervently for the coming of the Spirit. And once the Spirit comes, uh, he casts out fear. To be fearlessly open to the Holy Spirit, I think means being radically obedient to the quiet promptings of the Holy Spirit. And when we think, even if we're not quite sure, he is telling us to do something. He's instructing us to go pray with somebody or call somebody or speak about Jesus with somebody. We need to obey 
even if it means I might look foolish, even if it means I might fall on, flat on my face, I might fail, we do it anyway. And I've been learning in my life, the more you do that, the more clearly you're able to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And the more freedom you have, the less you think about human opinion. If we keep doing business as usual, we're gonna go out of business, you know? That we really need God himself to do something. There's a tendency to wanna to kinda of keep things under our control. And, and of course, God isn't under our control. God can work outside of accepted patterns. And I think Pope John Paul II, St. John Paul II, wanted to encourage us to be open to, he says, the new evangelization needs to be new in ardor, new in method, new in expression. So I think he's saying be open to new ways that the Spirit wants to work today. Be, be open to new expressions. Uh, don't, don't be quick to say, that's not what I'm used to. Uh, it may not be what you're used to, but it may be what the Holy Spirit needs to get you used to in order to be fruitful for him in the cultural environment that we're working in today. There is an intrinsic relationship between healing and evangelization. Going right back to the beginning, Jesus is commissioned to his disciples. Go proclaim the kingdom of God, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. And they did that. They did it during Jesus' earthly ministry, and then they did it all the more after Pentecost. And then in the early church, the Christians continued to do that. As they evangelized in word, they also did healings. The Lord, through them, did signs and wonders that confirmed the truth of the message they spoke. And that's meant to be a part of the church's evangelization in every age. It always has been a part in some degree, but today it's needed more than ever because people need more than words. They need to encounter the living God. We live in a culture where we are surrounded by the walking wounded. We are surrounded by people who desperately need the touch of the Lord, either physically or emotionally or spiritually. And we cannot proclaim the gospel to them in words alone. They need to experience the healing power and the love of the Lord through our faith. After learning about the connection between healing and evangelization, I contacted Dr. All right. Who's ready to be fearless tonight? Come on, don't be shy. Raise your hand, set out a whoop. I don't know. What does it sound like to be fearless in Christ? Whoo, hallelujah. He is risen. Amen. Hallelujah, he is risen. I, th I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And for those of you who couldn't make it and are watching us on the live stream tonight, um, we are living in a wonderful time of the church. It may not feel like it or even look like it at times, but I can assure you, you are here and Encounter is here. Uh, Renewal Ministries with uh, Dr. Ralph Martin is here. Dr. Healy is here. We are all here at the right time because you are born for such a time as this. And I know we hear that, but what does that mean? And I think um, I'm very appreciative of women like the director that you saw in the Fearless documentary, Mara. She was asking a simple question because she was just confounded by what the Holy Spirit could do in the Catholic Church. And I think from that simple childlike question, we have a connection with each other in the same way with the Holy Spirit. You and I have simple childlike questions of faith that if we will seek the answer to them, we will encounter a living God that is ready to do miracles, signs, and wonders, not just to make us happy, but to help others who are lost in this world encounter the truth. Because Jesus is still healing. Do you believe that? He's still healing today. Yes? Amen. He is still here with us today. In a few minutes, we're going to enter into the most blessed sacrament of the altar in Eucharistic adoration, where we are not just staring at a piece of gold and a piece of bread, but our faith tells us that we are staring into the throne room of the heavens at the one true king. Jesus himself. He literally is coming through the heavens into our presence and space here. Outside of all these metaphysical understandings, these big, big questions we as children don't need real answers for because we can take in faith 
that he's here and he's with us. So I want to welcome you again. My name is Kim Engel. I am the school director for the Encounter Campus here. Um, the Encounter School of Ministry was launched here in Palm Beach about two years ago. We have the great joy and pleasure of actually graduating our first two-year class of graduates. Yes, they stuck with us for two whole years and we're so pleased that many of them are here tonight and they are going to offer you through uh, the, the third portion of the night in prayer ministry, all of that they have learned about how to encounter this Holy Spirit that the director on Fearless was talking about. And they in fact have experienced that same kind of awe and wonder. And so they've been trained and equipped in understanding our faith and how to pray with you. So I hope if you have anything on your heart, if you came for physical healing or you just need um, you know, some consolations from our Lord, if you have a question on your heart, please come down during that time and let us pray with you. And um, before that though, we have a great honor of having another person who's been with all of those major media type logos like we saw on the, direct, on the documentary. Um, she herself has been out there in the Hollywood field and, um, and in news media before that in Boston and her accolades are amazing. I, I kind of think of her as Kevin Bacon. I know that might, she's like, there's some kind of six degrees of separation from Alexis here in the diocese. Like someone will know her because um, the Lord has just done so much with her, yes. And I think even if she gets a chance to share a little bit of her testimony tonight, I think you'll see how amazing it is when you just let the Lord encounter you where you are and then you step into mission with him. So I know someone's here tonight kind of wondering what to do next, or maybe they're listening online. And I think tonight's message is going to really give you that clarity of where God's calling you. But um, as you remain with us tonight to hear Alexis speak, and I'll introduce her more formally after, um, before we do all that, we, we want to enter into God's presence, right? We want to take away all of the anxiety, any kind of thoughts, confusion, any heaviness that we might have walked in here with, and we want to just lay that down at his feet. We want to give it all to him on the cross, to Jesus. And so I'm going to invite you now as Father Frank comes down. He is our spiritual director for the school here. And he's also one of our second year students who's graduating. So we are just so blessed to have him. And I just really want to invite you to feel that this is your home. We have freedom where the spirit of the Lord is. So if you want to come closer, look at this beautiful altar. God he doesn't pull out, like, he doesn't stop any of the glory, right? Like, look at this. <laughs> this is such a beautiful space. So if you want to come closer, if you feel like called to come, we don't have any kneelers out, and I know it's marble, but God will give you grace if you want to come and kneel and be just closer to him. Please feel free to do that. If you want to stand, sit, kneel, whatever you want to do. If you want to go sit at Mary's feet or the Good Shepherd or um, Divine Mercy, whatever God is calling you to do, we just want you to have that openness with us here at Encounter. And I'll leave you with this. You know, a lot of people are kind of enamored with the, the workings of the ministry of exorcism in these days. I don't know, have you guys seen a lot of like promotion of like certain exorcist and movies and crazy workings of, of what's going on in, in that field? Well, if you have, I, I want to just remind you um, that there's something even more powerful than exorcism. And it, it's the person who does it. It's Jesus. Just being in the presence of the sacrament can deliver us from every evil. Do you believe that? When we participate in the mass and we partake in Holy Communion, that is an exorcism. Um, we are invited today to, to come even more powerfully before the one who gives all freedom and deliverance. So as you're here with us tonight, I just want you to reflect um, on a few quotes. Uh, St. Alphonsus Liguori said, our Lord hears our prayers anywhere, but he has revealed to his servants that those who visit him in the Eucharist will obtain a more abundance of grace. And that's what we hope for you tonight. I pray that as you spend time with him in adoration, that you will feel a more abundance of his grace when it comes time for us to leave that. Uh, Saint Faustina says that Jesus told her, you can come to me in Eucharistic adoration at any time. I want to speak to you and I desire to grant you that grace. So I pray over you as you're with him today, 
that you too will hear his voice and have the Lord speak to you in the quietness of your heart. And um, I think, you know, Mother Teresa, you guys know Mother Teresa of of Calcutta. She said, adoration of the blessed sacrament is the best time you will spend on earth. So more than any other magic kingdom on earth, this is your best time on earth. Amen. And I pray that you get to frequent him often, as often as you can come. So, Father, I'm going to ask you to uh, go ahead and enter us in. And we'll turn down the lights for you um, just so you can enter more deeply into his presence. Thank you. Come Holy Spirit. Salutare Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Lord, before you ascended into heaven, you left us the greatest gift, the greatest treasure on earth, your real, true, substantial presence. We sit at your feet, Lord, to be filled by the Holy Spirit, by the grace and strength we need to be made courageous and strengthened like the apostles in the early church so that we too can be fearless and you can send us forth to proclaim your name.
You have given them bread from heaven. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of the sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. divine praises together. Blessed be God. Blessed be his holy name. Blessed be Jesus Christ, true God and true man. Blessed be the name of Jesus. Blessed be his most sacred heart. Blessed be his most precious blood. Blessed be Jesus and the most holy sacrament of the altar. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, the paraclete. Blessed be the great mother of God, Mary most holy. Blessed be your
It always feels so good, doesn't it? You just, everybody feel recharged, a little bit more at peace. Praise God, praise God. Well, now we get to go back to our uh, supernatural fire in the spirit with our next speaker. And um, hopefully all that peace you received from Jesus will just um, start to kindle in your heart a little bit more. And my prayer for you tonight is that as our guest, Alexis Walkenstein, talks with us and shares um, what the Holy Spirit has prepared through her to share with us tonight, that that will burn in you as well and just kind of start to ignite um, what the Holy Spirit is doing for you personally. So kind of a mini encounter, if you will. Um, for those of you who haven't heard of our guest tonight, I do have the great pleasure and joy to introduce Alexis Walkenstein, who is an Emmy award-winning TV journalist turned film producer and PR pro. I just love her name. Her PR company's name is like B-A, right? A-W-E, it's actually her initials, but how like just creative is that? <laughs> it's, you, were, you were chosen for this, this is perfect. So um, she's been in the media business for a while, right? She uh, began in the news industry in Boston, if I recall correctly, and um, covering murders, fires, the Kennedys, like, um, Super Bowls, sex abuse scandal in the church, uh, death and funeral of St. John Paul II, right? That is amazing. If you do not already know about her uh, social media account, she is on Instagram and Facebook and beautiful pictures. Um, I, I feel like I'm a JP2 generation as well. Uh, he had such a profound impact on my growth in the faith as well. So. Um, we share that together and I'm, I'm pleased to see that fire in her. She actually became the chief spokesperson for the bishop here in the diocese, Bishop Barbarito. So some of you may remember her from her time with us here. And um, it was actually her deep desire in the church uh, to renew the church and see it renewed that she ended up leaving us, boo, <laughs> but thankful for the desire. Um, though we missed her, she actually went on to even more important roles. And um, it was Pope John Paul II, she says, who inspired her to go to the uncomfortable places. So she did leave a very comfortable place here in Palm Beach and went to some very uncomfortable places, which we'll hear about, and um, did a, a little bit of mainstream time in the newsroom. And um, it was after her experience with JP2's passing that Alexis went to Rome um, and obviously was stirred in her heart there toward a deeper, a deeper call to service. So as is so often true of our own journeys, we get that initial stirring, not knowing where God is bringing us. And then, you know, we have another encounter with him and he brings us even deeper and gives us an even um, wider view of what he's trying to accomplish through us. So I feel like her journey tonight is one that will be one of encouragement um, for many of us, for her to go from her, her beginnings here with us even um, into the media streams and platforms that she's currently in is amazing. So she uh, has led publicity and strategy for some of the biggest faith films released out of Hollywood. You may know some of them for Greater Glory, The Way, Little Boy, I Can Only Imagine, Molly, Breakthrough, which is actually my son's favorite, I Still Believe, which I cannot get myself to watch because I'm just, I, some movies I just can't go into that depth of emotion and cry. <laughs> that one's gonna get me, but I will watch it. I'm gonna watch it for you. Okay, Blind Eyes Opened, Across, Fatima the movie. How many of you got to see Fatima the movie? Amazing, right? Yeah, perfectly timed. Um, the story of Patrick Payton, Pray right? The family prays together, stays together. Amen. Um, the Trump I know, resurrection, alive, the harbinger of things to come, slaves and kings, St. Michael. This could keep your movie nights. Like maybe if you make a, I think you could like plan as a family to do each of her movies every Friday for like a year and it'll keep your movie schedule going. Hold on, She Was Stronger, Jesus Revolution, and Unplanned, which she co-produced and traveled worldwide for distribution. And I know you're working with another great fantastic film, which I hope you'll share a little bit about. 
And, um, and then if she wasn't already busy enough and deeper into her mission, she felt called to write a book or to help write the book in, um, on the life of Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen, who is uh, being beatified, right? We're waiting. We're just, we're waiting for that official title of saint to come down. But um, she has a fantastic uh, story of encounter with, with the blessed saint there as well. So um, if you haven't had a chance to read her book, we do have them out on the table outside. So please feel free to stop and visit. I don't know, she may be around to sign copies and say hello and visit. I know some of you are here to kind of say hello again to her and catch up. But right now we're excited to have you come and share the next hour of grace with us and all of your beautiful words of wisdom. So please everyone extend a warm welcome to Alexis Walkenstein. If this microphone works, I'm going to try to do it from down here since it's such an intimate crowd and I want to separate us from each other. Um, thank you so much, Kim, for having me tonight. And thank you to all of you that could be doing any number of things on a Friday night, but you came to spend time with Jesus. And um, this night isn't about me and, and my path, but it's about the power and demonstration of God and what he can do in a life. And I know that you are all in a school of the Holy Spirit, a school for Encounter Ministries, and that some of you are here just to receive more. Whatever your, your call is tonight, whatever led you here tonight, I'm praying uh, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit that nobody in the name of Jesus leaves here the same. I know, Lord, that this is an intimate crowd, and you are not a God about numbers. You had a very small gang of apostles in that upper room that you called the Twelve, and um, you took that 12 and you multiplied and multiplied and multiplied. You had a specific assignment for each of them. And I pray tonight, Lord God, that whatever it is that you have under every person, your sons and daughters under their feet, that it becomes clear, that they hear something prophetically for them, that they begin to see the power of God in a new way to take them wherever it is that you want them to go for your glory and your holy will. And we ask you, Mother Mary, angels and saints, to be with us tonight and to fill all of these other seats in the name of Jesus, amen. So yes, I spent five years of my life here and in the pastoral center. I was a very young communications director. Um, I grew up in Boston and I started my media career there in the mainstream. Um, when I was very, very young in college, uh, my parents um, decided when it was my turn to, turn to go to school that they did not want me to go anywhere except for a all-women's college run by nuns uh, in a very secluded area um, west of Boston. And it was like, what? I went to public school for my whole life, and the concept of being so secluded and confined was a beginning to feel like a shroud that was cast over my big, big dreams to work in television and media and things that I hadn't really fully imagined, but I was looking at over the horizon and this little tiny college didn't seem like it was gonna bring me anywhere. Um, what would nuns have to offer me to get to my destination? What would seclusion and confinement have to offer me to get to my destination? But it was the very aspect and character of confinement and isolation and prayer and littleness is where God operates and molds us to go out and be sent to do his will. So I thank my mother and father for having such a vision of protection, preparation, and formation for their child. So for you parents that are forming your children, do not be afraid and do not let them lead you, you lead them. You lead them because you are bringing them to a place of transformation. You are the head of the household for your family. And I thank God that my parents um, really doubled down on that for me. There was a moment when I wanted to leave my little college run by nuns. I was a sophomore in college and the wanderlust of my other friends from high school who were in other bigger territories and seemed to have bigger opportunities were very tempting for me. They had boyfriends. They had all kinds of things that I didn't have. And I, I told my academic advisor to draw up the withdrawal papers 
and that I would be leaving. <laughs> I hadn't consulted anybody in my family, especially those paying the bills. And he was listening very graciously. And at a certain poignant pause, I didn't notice that in the narrow, very movie-like, beautiful office with all wood, hardwood floors, library feel, that there was an ancient habited nun with a newspaper and she pulled the newspaper down and she said, my dear, could you consider it a sacrifice to stay? And I was very young, but I knew exactly what God was asking of me. I knew that the dream that he had put in my heart, that the destination that I saw ahead of time would be something that he would fulfill, but only if I had obedience. I didn't understand because I didn't see any, any spiritual cake or occupational cake baking, but God is always working behind the scenes to prepare us. And he uses a place of confinement because God is the God of confinement. He was hidden with the Holy Family before his public ministry began. And in that hiddenness, in the unknownness, God was working. When I graduated, from college, I had interned two places. I went to Washington, D.C. to American University for a journalism semester, and then I interned in Boston at the NBC station, and I was trying to land a full-time job in Boston. I didn't want to go to Binghamton, New York, and I didn't want to go to Buffalo, New York, or faraway small places. I had done the small thing in college, and I was ready to be in a major market in my mind. I was sending letters everywhere. I was bold for the kingdom of God. I had people telling me, why don't you go work for EWTN? And I was like, no, I want to go so far out there for Jesus. I love God, but I want to go out. I want to go out in the world. And God will honor our dreams. God will honor that for a season, and then he'll start to take us his way. So I was sending letters everywhere, and I was sitting by the pool waitressing at night, and my father was getting kind of upset because I didn't have a real job yet. And one of the letters came back, and a woman who was the secretary to the executive producer for Tom Brokaw at NBC Nightly News left a message on our answering machine. These are the days of answering machine. And I was listening to the machine go off while I was outside at our backyard pool, and sound travels over water. and. I didn't want to answer the phone so that no one thought I wasn't very busy. And that it was so sensational of a phone call from NBC Nightly News that I thought my dad was playing a prank on me. It didn't seem realistic. I'm praying, Lord, if you want me to work in TV, you have to make a way. You have to make a way. I, I have nothing. And here God is making a way, and I thought I was getting pranked by my dad. I called my dad at his office and I said, I can't believe you had your secretary pretend that they were calling from NBC Nightly News. Like, kick a girl while she's down hunting for a job. And he said, that wasn't us. We didn't, we weren't playing a joke. So for the second time in my life where I was asked to consider it a sacrifice to stay in a place of confinement when I was in college, I took a trip to New York to meet with this executive producer thinking he was going to hire me. He wanted me. He liked my resume. He liked what I wrote. I was persistent. I was tenacious. All the things that I had. And when he sat me down, he asked me what I wanted to do in the business, and I said, I want to be an anchor. I want to be on TV. And he said, he shook his head very seriously, not, not in a negative way. He said, that's not for you. He said, you have the look, you have the smarts, the power and the influence is behind the camera. And I want you to consider that path. God was taking me all the way to New York, not for a job, but to speak to me prophetically through a man in a very high position that didn't necessarily need to have time for a 21-year-old looking for a full-time job that he was never going to hire because they don't hire inexperienced people. God used this man to speak to me and say, essentially, if you do it my way, I will take you very far. Without an ego, with humility, 
and in a strategic way to use your position for the glory of God. Did he say all those things? No, but I knew inside what was happening. Short time later, I started working in field producing for the presidential pool that was coming to Boston very frequently. One thing led to another, and I was hired for the NBC station in Boston. I worked my way up the ranks. I was taken to New York after five years, worked for CBS Evening News and the local news, came back to Boston. I didn't necessarily want to be back in news. I left New York after the Lord showed me when your lease is up, you're going to leave your job. This is when God started to really speak to me. And we're talking about transforming the culture. And in order to transform the culture, we have to be transformed. We have to be willing to listen to God. We have to be willing to meet with God on a regular basis so we can hear his voice. The pull of the world today is so strong that we can miss what God has for us. We can miss what God is calling us to do if we listen to people who are not listening to God, people who are not serving God, if we listen to the news, if we listen to social media, if we listen to all the things that are creating a racket around us and we don't get silent and listen to God's will, we will, we will miss it and sometimes it will lead us to a place of, of not, not, safe, not being safe. In this instance, I was very alone in New York. I was young, working nights for the 11 o'clock news. And God was working on me in different ways to make New York repugnant to me. And yet, I love New York. My family was always in New York. My sister lived in New York. It was a dream to live and work in New York. And yet, God was showing me a darkness. And I couldn't shake it. I was in prayer. And when my parents came to visit me, for my birthday, I dropped the news on them that when my lease was up, I was going to leave my big job and come home and basically wait for further instructions from Jesus. What kind of a nut does that? I loved hearing some of the encounter ministry leaders talking about we cannot, we cannot be looking for favor or approval from people around us. And in my case, if I was waiting for approval from anyone around me, I would not be where I am today. I would not be doing any of the things that God has me doing. And it's very uncomfortable to do it the way of the Lord. And the reason why it's uncomfortable to do it the way of the Lord is because we don't always have a kingdom mindset. We're so groomed, even the church, to be like the world that we can miss what God has for us. So my prayer for you tonight is that you will be taking away the idea of becoming more like the kingdom of God in the way that we approach every aspect of our life. So I went against the grain, quit a huge job. When my lease was up, I gave my news director my notice and he pushed it back. Like the temptation even in the face of following God and the voice that he was saying, leave when your lease is up basically and I'll tell you what to do next. The temptation was so strong to say, eh, maybe that wasn't really Jesus. The news director pushed my resignation letter back. I pushed it back to him, and I stuck with it. I moved home. It was uncomfortable. I moved in with my parents. They weren't sure if I might have been cracking up. Who, who leaves a job at WCBS TV? Who leaves a job without having a job? Isn't that what all the career counseling tells us, don't leave a job without having a job. God forbid we prepare for what God has us doing next and take time to listen to him, tell us, prepare us, and train our soul. Months were going by and my dad was getting frustrated. He, you know, we, my sister and I were raised kind of like guys. We worked. We were workers from the time we were very young. So to be idle was like not cool. My dad was challenging me, and I said, Dad, God told me to leave, and I know that he has something for me. I don't know exactly what it is, but I'm trusting him. But he wanted me to just take any job. I said, I'm not doing that. That's a distraction. So one morning, I was asleep around 8.30, and my dad called. 
and other family members called, and the Twin Towers had come down in New York. And my dad said, I'll never question you again. Would I have necessarily been in lower Manhattan where the towers came down? Not necessarily, I had friends that were. But maybe God wanted to spare me from the psychological trauma of that. Maybe God needed to pull me out so that he could ready me for the next assignment. That night we went to church. We stayed very late till after midnight. We were worshiping and praising God and asking God to protect our country. We were, everyone was in turmoil, but we went to Jesus. My dad stayed home, and when we got home, he was sitting upright in his chair. And we were like, are we in trouble because we're out after midnight? And CBS Evening News had called that very night, needed me to call right away because they wanted a field producer to produce terror cell investigations in the investigation for the planes that took off from Boston. I needed to be free of distraction and ready for the next assignment. And sometimes we don't even know that we, where we're headed next, but God does. And when we're obedient to him, he will show us where he's taking us. So right away on September 12th, I started working for CBS Evening News in a temporary kind of producer role. It was very crazy in Boston. We were doing terror cell investigations for 48 hours. We were doing investigations of the planes that were taking off from Massport, hunting Osama bin Laden relatives in Cambridge. And I still didn't really know what the real plan was for my life because everything seemed crazy demonic and temporary and I just kept saying Lord maybe this is why you took me out for a while to be a light in the midst of this my original station called and rehired me very quickly because they heard I was back on the street I said Lord I didn't really want to go back into news it's dark it's dark but he was pushing me back in and a few months later the sex abuse scandal in Boston with Boston as its epicenter broke, and I became the lead field producer there. Little did I know the war on our nation became the war on our church, and God had a place for me to go in and be his light. Not all of it was comfortable, but the glory of God was there. Some of you don't know where you're headed next. Some of you are in the School of the Holy Spirit here in the Encounter Ministries. You might not know how God is calling you, where he's leading you. You might feel like you are sidelined. You might feel like you're too old, too young. You don't have the experience, the equipness, or anyone walking with you. You might have a vision in your mind and your heart, and nobody else has seen the vision, and that's lonely. But God tonight is saying, I can do anything with you. With a surrendered life, a transformed life, a life fastened to me, a life fastened to my sacraments, a life of a son and a daughter willing to do his will above all, no matter who thinks what of you. In case you haven't noticed, our days are dark. There is a war on the church. There is a war on our families. There is a war on femininity and womanhood. There is a war on marriage. There is a war on everything that we believe as Christians. And it is not a time to sit back. It is not a time to be afraid. It is a time to ask God to fan the flame of the gifts of our sacramental life and to infill and infill and infill. There is never a day in the life of Catholicism and Christianity where we are all done and we are filled up. Because you're gonna pour it out if we're doing it right we're gonna pour it out and then we're gonna to need to be filled up again. You're gonna pour it out and you're gonna to need to be filled up again. You're gonna pour it out and you're gonna to need to be filled up again. You're gonna be wrung out if you're doing it right. And then you're gonna to need to be filled up again. You're gonna be broken, you're gonna be betrayed, you're gonna be tired. But the glory of God is operative. Because the same God who is confined and then assigned by the Father 
to take the cross, the wood of the cross, for all of our sins and sicknesses. We are his sons and daughters, and we have to resemble him. We will suffer. We will suffer as we're doing work for him. But his glory outweighs the suffering. There's glory in the woundedness. And however he's calling you and leading you, he will show up and do the work if you invite him in. I never imagined my life going from news to the diocese, to the diocese, to the movies, like schizophrenic Jesus, what is going on? Um, however, I will say to you all, what you're doing today will not be what you're doing tomorrow. What you're doing tomorrow might not be what you're doing the next day. And these are the times where it's so dark that God is saying to you, you can't get comfortable. You can't get comfortable and stay the same. No longer is it like okay to be like doing the same thing for a long period of time. God needs us to be apostolic witnesses to bring the gospel to the ends of the earth. For me, the ends of the earth at one point were Palm Beach. <laughs> I, a missionary life to me would be like Africa, but it was here. I went from the scandal in Palm Beach, in Boston to Palm Beach, and I was so zealous for God, I thought I was gonna be here at a point where the scandals had subsided. And I sat down in the chair the first day and they told me that I was here for the largest financial embezzlement scandal in US church history. And I wanted to just put my sneakers on and walk right up 95 North. The grace of God operating here in this beautiful diocese that God loves so much is a holy, holy bishop that was a father to me. All the broken pieces of my soul going through the sex abuse scandal in Boston, reading documents that, of things that had never been reported that I couldn't get out of my mind. God healed me in this diocese under a very holy bishop in the office of one beautiful episcopacy. And the other thing that God did for me here was he gave me holy women. I would call home and beg my parents to listen to my rants about how lonely I was here and that I would probably be quitting soon. You know, when God has a big assignment for you, the devil will come right behind it and try to tempt you right out of it. We have to understand the tactics of the enemy. When God is blessing, the enemy is going to try to destroy. And so for me, the temptation was to leave. The place where God had for me to serve a diocese in need was not just that, but God, I was a woman in need. I was a young woman that had been battered in the mainstream. I had been battered in all kinds of life situations like we all are, and God had a parallel work to do in my life of healing, deliverance, a school of the Holy Spirit. My encounter ministries happened in a Haitian house with Deacon Steve Emil, he's deceased, and his beautiful daughters, Emily and Matilda, Matilda's here. My mother kept praying, send her holy women so she can stay as long as God has her there. And I would hang up on my mother because I didn't want to indulge the prayer. I wanted to indulge my pain. How many of us do that? We want to stay in the, in the yuck and we don't want to go into action of prayer. So sure enough, my mother kept saying, Lord, send her holy women, send her holy women, send them. I'm like, there's nobody here. There's not even women. There's not, like I was thir in my 30s. So I'm working with priests and bishops and nuns and I was extremely lonely, but God had me in this place of isolation and confinement again. Like going back to my college days, he was doing a work inside of me. And I met Emmeline and Mathilde. I was helping a priest. Whenever you help a priest, by the way, you're gonna get blessed in ways that you can't imagine. So never say no to a priest. I was helping a priest, part of this event. These two beautiful Haitian women approached me and said, the Lord shows us he would like us to pray with you. I said, yeah, bring it on. I needed a lot of prayer. I felt like I was very alone firing <laughs> against missiles that were coming against the church. I couldn't talk about anything. I suffered with the church as the church suffered. And these women ministered to me in a way that is indescribable. They invited me to pray inside their home. 
every Friday night for as long as God had me in this diocese until it was done. And I thought when I left here that that was a season for these women, and I was very sad. I was intimidated by their, the heights of their spirituality and their faith, their fidelity, their ability to walk by faith and not by sight, and all of the things that they taught me for the things that I needed for where I was headed that I couldn't even see yet. And little did I know that God would let them keep walking with me all the way to today. If God is calling you to serve, if you're in Encounter Ministries and in a school of the Holy Spirit, rest assured that God is calling you to do something great for him, but also know that you can't do it alone. We are the body of Christ, and God doesn't make us work in isolation. We have to fellowship with heaven, and we have to have serious intercessors and disciples of the Lord walking with us here. It might not be your family. For me, it's not always my family. My parents, yes. I have the grace of beautiful parents who are so sacrificial in watching me and supporting me wherever God leads me. But I needed more than that. I needed Emmeline and Mathilde to disciple me, to train me, to train my hands for war. My desire to leave here became a great sorrow when God was moving me forward. The very place I wanted to reject became a place of such love and instruction and grace overflowing. And yet God was moving my feet forward to wider territory, into movies, go figure. I never studied anything about movies. We watch movies like crazy. I'm in that generation. I love movies. Um, we all acted, we were theatrical, but working on movies. And at times when I reflect on my period of time here and I look back, it was really Bishop Barbarito who handed me the movie Bella and said, I really want to do something with this here. I had never seen a priest or a bishop with the exception of the Passion of the Christ when I was in TV days say, I want to do something with a movie. It was the first time I really saw the bridging of the culture of the church and the world and something like filmmaking for the glory of God. So God was showing me my future, even though I had no knowledge about it and I couldn't perceive it at all. I would be working in movies, many, many movies. So what you can't perceive tonight, ask God to show you by the power of the Holy Spirit exactly where he's calling you right now. It's better than you expect. It's bigger than you could imagine because God needs his disciples, but he needs agile feet. He needs people that are going to say yes like the Blessed Mother, even when they only have the beginning and the end and not the middle. When the angel Gabriel came to Our Lady and foretold the things to come, she gave her yes without even knowing what would go down in the middle. Behold, you are highly favored. The Holy Spirit has overshadowed you. It is by the Holy Spirit that this has been done. You will bear a son. How could this be? I do not know man. Many of us could say, how could this be? I don't, I don't, know, I don't know this. I don't have this. How many times could we say to God, I don't, I don't have the equipment? But it's by the Holy Spirit that God is going to overshadow you. Every time I pray the, the mysteries of the rosary where we meditate on the Annunciation, I meditate on her yes so that I'll always say yes to God even when I don't want to. And I ask the Holy Spirit to have a share of the power of God that came over her, that that same power of God will come over me and create something where there's nothing. We are in the resurrection season where God is in the business of bringing dead things to life. So whatever dead dreams you have, whatever relationships, whatever vocational issues there are, whatever work issues, whatever dreams you've left on the sidelines, Tonight, God wants to breathe new life into those and transform them, purify them, and bring them to his way in your life. If we want to truly transform the culture, we have to be willing to suffer. We have to be willing to die to ourselves and be different than everybody else. And that culture begins in our own homes. We can't be watching the same things that the world is watching. 
we can't be reading the same things that the world is reading. We can't be seeking power from gurus and yoga and fortune tellers and psychics. We have to seek the power of God from the power source. And we can't be afraid to confront people, even in our own families, that are living outside of the bounds of Christ when they're baptized, when they're away from the sacraments. They will reject us, but we have to speak. We have to proclaim. When God says to open our mouth, we can't be afraid. The culture that we need to transform first is ourselves, our home environments, and then God can use us to go out other places. We can't be a hypocrite at home and then go out and say the name of Jesus everywhere. Very important. I know that God is doing a great work in this diocese. I know that everyone that came here tonight is going to receive. I know that if you open your hearts, there is much that God wants to do in your life. Not just in ministry, but to heal you, to deliver you, to set you free so that the power of God that you know can be proclaimed, so that you're credible witnesses, that you see his power and then you tell of his power. To see and know and hear of his power means to be near his power. And so we are in right now a Eucharistic revival. We don't need the bishops to tell us that we need a Eucharistic revival. I'm just here as a small instrument to say that any good that comes out of my life comes from prayer, surrender to God, and sitting face to face with Jesus Christ. He is not a dead God. He's alive. Anyone here that doesn't believe it or know it or has never heard it, he's alive. He's alive. He's as alive today as he was when he walked the earth. He is alive, and he's doing the same miracles. And he wants to do them for you first and foremost so that you can tell others and to be his witnesses. So I just praise God for what he's going to do tonight. I thank him for this opportunity to be here. I'll be here through the night if anyone has any questions. I hope that you will pick up the book Fulton Sheen, mostly because it is testimonial. It's a compilation of, it's really Fulton Sheen. It's all his works. It's a re-presentation of some of his greatest writings. When I encountered Fulton Sheen, I was working next door. I am the John Paul II generation. I grew up under his pontificate, encountered him many times, covered his life and death. Fulton Sheen I knew from a news point of view that I knew he won an Emmy Award, and I did too. I knew he was in television and on TV, but that's all I knew. When it got tough here, I began to ask him to pray. And I didn't know he was on track for sainthood at all. I knew a lot as a journalist and as someone that worked every day with church news and information, but I had no knowledge that he was, you know, a servant of God at the time on track for sainthood. I began to pray to him and I would ask him to help Bishop Barbarito be bold even when bishops didn't want to really face the news media, that there would always be an opportunity to bring the gospel even to a secular journalist or just the people watching, that, that the fear of any kind of... Uh, witch hunt or pursuit of the church would be disarmed and that Bishop Sheen would give divine strategy to me as I served the bishop in a communications role. I had simple prayers, nothing fancy, but I would be aware of him, dead bishop, pray for me, didn't know he was going to be a saint or anything. Around that time, my family and I went to New York because we all love New York. We all lived there at one point. We went to see the Rockettes. We took my niece. It was my aunt's. It was a girl's trip. And we said some of, you know, some of the family was into it and some was not into Jesus. And those that were into it said, well, we're going to go to Mass. The rest of the gang said, well, we want to see St. Patrick's too. Half the group left. Half stayed for Mass. Always, always stay because God always has something extra. This is the moral of this story. Always stay for the more. We went to Mass. We went around the back of the altar. We wanted to show one of my aunts the beauty of the side chapels and the cathedral. She had never been to New York, to this cathedral. I got talking to someone. I turned around. They were kneeling behind the altar. There were three kneelers. I took position in the third kneeler to unite my prayers to theirs. On my engraved 
marker. It said, prayer for the canonization of servant of God, Fulton J. Sheen. I was like, wow, Lord, he's really praying for me. We had, so I had this connection. Then I realized, oh, he must be buried underneath. I said to the security guard, is Fulton Sheen buried down there? He was like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, we need to go in. And he's like, huh? I wanted to go in. I wanted to get closer. Encounter. I persisted, and the security guard, God bless him, he knew I wasn't giving up, so he got the sacristan named Ian, who was like a million years old. He had keys around his neck. One of those keys was to the crypt. Somehow they figured out I worked for a New York bishop and said, who works for Bishop Barbarito? I said, I do. He said, wait till the next mass is done. I'll take the three of you down. We went in the crypt. I felt like a kid in a candy store. I love the saints. I love the church. I had been praying to this bishop for Bishop Barbarito. I had been praying to this bishop to intercede for the office of bishop and the renewal of the church, the renewal of the priesthood, for the use of the media, for the proclamation of the gospel. And I was getting to go down and pray with this great saint-to-be. I was getting schooled, school of encounter. I went in the crypt with my aunt, my mom. We all had different intentions. We were silent. It felt like we were in there forever. And when we came up the stairs, like sometimes when you have an encounter with the saints or with God, there's like a lightness. And I was laughing. And my mother said, what are you laughing at? Like, because it was kind of a serious moment. And I said, well, I just told Fulton Sheen, if you answer my five intentions, I'll promote you. And we were like, ha-ha, win-win, he's, he's, you know, he's already famous. I turned my phone on when we hit Fifth Avenue. This is a demonstration of God. My email, I'm a publicist. I was working for the diocese. When the phone's off for more than an hour, you better check on your emails. You never know what bombs are dropping. Well, the bomb that dropped was an email from a priest named Father Stanley Deptula, Dear Alexis, my name is Father D Stanley Deptula. I'm the executive director of the Fulton J. Sheen Foundation. I heard about you, and I'm wondering if you would help us promote Fulton Sheen. I almost was hit by all the traffic on Fifth Avenue. I raised my hands to the heavens, and I said, every prayer that I prayed in that crypt is getting answered, but God was putting me to work first. I came back from the trip. Bishop Barbarito knew I was getting together with my family in New York. He's a New Yorker. We were going to go see the Rockettes. He asked about the Rockettes. I said they were great, but something better happened. Can we bring this priest from Peoria, Illinois, to the diocese? I really believe that Fulton Sheen is our special intercessor in heaven to bring a renewal to this diocese and the whole church. I told him the story, and he said yes. To this date, Four of the five intentions have been answered. These intentions were not small. These were impossible intentions. Three for others, two for me. The biggest one remains, but it's on the way. We have to persevere with God. We have to press in to be where God is and where God's saints are. And when you press into God's heart and his saints, He's going to give you your mission. It's not going to be what you expect. It never is. But with your openness and your yes, you will do great things for the glory of God. So may God bless you all. Please buy the book. I give all the, the money to the nuns, published by Pauline Media. But I want you to be able to build up your faith through the testimony that's there and to have another saint in heaven, a media apostle, an evangelization apostle, to intercede for you as you go forward from here. God bless you. So since we have kind of an intimate time right now, um, 
we're going to do things just slightly different. Normally, we would just kind of move into prayer ministry, but I feel like like we've really kind of gotten intimate with Alexis, and I think some of you might have a question for her. Like, if you have any questions, and it's kind of like class time, Peter. You're getting ready to, like, shoot it up. I can see. No. So, please, if there's anything on your heart, like, you just want some, like, more encouragement or clarification, anyone? Now's the time. You got, yeah. Joseph, stand up. Yeah. No, yeah. If you have any, uh, if anything resonated, like, if, um, kind of call it like an echo, like, if she said something that you were like, that is so me, God is like doing the same thing, please. And let's encourage each other. We get so few moments like this, guys. This is the time, like, these nights are for encouraging each other. So encourage us, keep encouraging us. Come on, don't be shy. I'm year two, same cohort as uh, Joe, and we're in, the, as you said, we're in the process of um, going through our kingdom dreams and discerning what is the next step for us as we leave, leave the classroom, because we'll never leave encounter. Shouldn't say that in front of you, that we'll never leave encounter, but what you said is really inspirational. It's listening to the call and answering the call and to press in more with the call to identify which is from God and which is from the devil, the world. Yeah, so that was really getting a view outside of the classroom that it's not only the classroom, it works everywhere. And it never ends. And You're always going to have to discern, yeah. like, for your whole life. And it should be, never, yeah. Like, oh, I got to the finish line. You know, it's like for every day, it's a new chapter. You're always growing in yes. Christ, yeah. Yes. Any more? Back in the back, just holler really loud. Um, it's funny because I, I mean, I never saw myself working in the movie field, uh, which is such a surprise from Jesus. And, you know, even what I'm doing today might not be what I'm doing tomorrow. But for right now, in this season, God has opened a door. And by the way, like he sent me to L.A. Um, I could be here for hours going to the rest of the story. But when I went to L.A., it was a very um, seemingly crooked path. The only thing that was clear was the door was open. I was being invited to go. And I was, I was struggling, but I was going to adoration every day, pressing into God to show me. And I had worked in the movie arena a little bit previously, but the company I worked for closed. So I felt like it wasn't a trustworthy mission field. And God just needed to close that mission field because he needed my feet to go wider. But we don't understand, like, when things shut down, we can take things personal. We could say, that's a bummer, that was then, this is now. And God doesn't want us to have that mindset. He wants us to have a kingdom mindset to know that if he's closing a door, he's opening a bigger one. In the interim, I went into mainstream again. And I was hired, my contract said December 9th, which is the anniversary of the death of Fulton Sheen. So I was sure that this was of the Lord. And it was. God gave me, have you ever been baited by the Lord so you'd walk forward only to get in and it was like a hot nightmare? But God needs to give you that bait to go forward. When the assignment's hard, it doesn't mean run. I'm finally learning that. It means walk through the flames. And in that assignment, I was given something really horrific to do, um, uh, a client assignment that was very demonic. 
And God was like, I don't need you to run away from it. I need you to bring the grace right into it. This was like turning divine mercy on its head for me. I didn't get it. I called Mathilde. I was like, I called everybody but Mathilde because I kind of felt like I knew Mathilde was going to tell all the truth and nothing but the truth according to the Lord. So I called everybody else first. And finally, when I called her, I was talking and talking and she said, be quiet. Jesus wants to talk to you. She was already praying in tongues. She was worshiping. She was speaking and she said, this is not your final assignment. The Lord says, this is not your final assignment, but when your job is done, you'll be moving on. And it was exactly as prophesied. I didn't like the answer. Sometimes, my friends, we are not going to like the answer. But we have to be obedient because it's where the obedience is, where the glory of God rests. I was obedient. I stayed with it until the last day God said, today's the day you leave. I said, Lord, I can't go through not working anymore. He said, I got you. You're going to leave today. As I processed this with Mathilde later, um, she said the Lord showed her that he, God needed me to enter back into the mainstream very temporarily. There were two, two parts to this. One was to minister to a man on the brink of hell. Number two was to, God needed to show me I had been out of the world work, working for the church, working in movies, faith movies for like seven years. God needed to show me how low, how the world had really devolved. Because sometimes I could get in my flesh the opinion that some of these movies weren't that great, some of these faith movies. Maybe this isn't really what God is calling me to do because the quality is not that great. And when Mathilde was ministering to me, she said, the Lord needed to really show you the value of where you're headed. And I was headed to LA, I didn't know it yet. I had another holy woman come to me out of nowhere but God's hand who graciously took time, and this is very important for all of us, to take time to minister to others, to not be so greedy for God that we keep him to ourselves, but that we, you know, if God is showing us something in prayer for someone, we minister to them and we serve them. We have to come to a place of not just receiving but giving. And that's what Matilda and Emmeline really taught me um, in ways that are beyond anything I've ever experienced in the Catholic Church. And I would not be able to go forward in difficult, dark areas, or even just not seeing the full picture. The world wants us to have contracts, five weeks of vacation, $300,000 a year, this, that, and the other. And God is like, I smashed that, and I'm sending you. I'm not telling you what's going to happen on the other side. I'll have all the manna coming down from heaven for you, but you're going to need to walk. God was like, walk with me, walk with me, walk with me. This is hard to do, and it's harder for the people around us that really can't see it. But we have to be that bold. We have to be that bold, and that's why we need people in our life who have prophetic vision, who have prophetic dream, who have a relationship with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who can discern with us and help us answer God's call. Prophecy is not for us to know and have things ahead of time just because. Prophecy is predominantly so that we will do the hard thing even when we don't understand and answer his call. So the movie thing for me in that period became um, like this is more important above anything. And from around 2015 when I went to Los Angeles to just do movies all the time to 2023, whoa, how low the media world has gone. The importance of us changing the culture <laughs> excuse me, to keep putting out content for families and for people in a pornified culture that can watch things. It doesn't have to be a Jesus movie, but it can be just a wholesome story. I do other films that are not necessarily Christian, but that have a good moral story. It's very important because the world today, there are no options. So that's the reason why I do it. That's the reason why many men and women feel called to do the same. The studio's have a different objective, it's money. They know that there's an audience now that they never cracked. The Passion of the Christ opened you know, the doors for so many other filmmakers to bring these stories. And so a lot of studios are hip to the tune now that there's a huge family audience and a Christian audience. And so like any other genre, they need to service it. So that's a long answer to a short question. No, that's great, that's great. Yeah, I, I 
I was thinking, like, um, I was watching something the other day, and it, I, I was almost counting how many times they could put the word Catholic into the show. <laughs> like, they kind of caught on to this thing, like, if you just mention Catholics or if you just make the family Catholic but don't actually show them going to church, like, now they've got all this money because Catholics can watch them because they're Catholic. Do you see, like, you see that kind of ugly side, like you were pointing out oh, yeah. with the question, but I think what you touched on was really key for some of us here, like, why even do it? Um, we talk about, like, do we, do we just kind of seclude ourselves and just let the secular, you know, worldly culture just have their way, or do, is it worth the fight? And I think your, your response shows us that it's worth the fight. It's worth the fight if God's put you there right? If God's putting you there, it's because he wants you to walk through the fire. Yeah, if God's putting you, it could be any industry. I mean, there's so many industries that have become godless, woke, whatever it is. If he's sending you there, there's a reason. If he's sending you there, there's a plan for you, and he won't leave you orphan in that. Um, I remember just going to church when I found out exactly what I was assigned to do at this mainstream PR firm, and I cried on the floor, and I just said, God, you duped me. You sucked me in on Fulton Sheen's feast day. I can't believe this is what it is. And, and God probably wanted to dope slap me and say, like, don't you get it? I'm using you. I'm using you. And I needed the people around me to help me see that. Um, and so he will send us into hard places he, to do hard and holy things. And it's not always dependent on our words, but our fidelity. If we're receiving Holy Communion, we become a monstrance again like Our Lady carrying Jesus, we, if we truly believe the power of God rests in us, it doesn't necessarily hinge on words, but to bring him into a demonic place and quietly declare and decree that this place will be turned over for Jesus Christ, you will watch the house of cards come down, and I've seen it. And so you have to be willing. I mean, it's not just um, now. I mean, we have the abortion battle. We have pornography. We have sex trafficking. We have so many things that we're battling the transgender and God needs us to be pure vessels in prayer. Um, it doesn't mean we're necessarily going into work in those industries, but we can take those demonic infrastructures down uh, when we're praying and sacrificing, especially suffering for the kingdom of God. That's really good. Patty, you have a question? Well, I was just reading the gospel back. Um, you know, the Annunciation is one of my favorite gospel passages. I feel like everything in the life of Christ and what happens through salvation history begins there with Our Lady. And if we're daughters and sons of Our Lady, we can ask for a share of everything she has. And so as the angel Gabriel appeared to her and declared unto her that she would become the mother of God, she wasn't married. She didn't have relations with a man, and she simply said, how could this be? I do not know man. Fear not. It is by the Holy Spirit that this has happened. So when we pray and enter into that one eternal act of the Annunciation, oftentimes my prayer is, Mother Mary, intercede for me. You are the spouse of the Holy Spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit to overshadow me as well. That whatever it is that God is announcing over my life, ask God for the announcement that I would hear it. Give me the docility through your intercession to say yes like you, and that the power of God would come down the way the power of God came down over you. She is the mother of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes to her in the Annunciation, and then she's in the upper room at Pentecost, as the apostles are terrified about what they're going to have to do, Jesus has commissioned them, and they're in the upper room, and they don't want to leave. They don't, the doors are still closed, and she's praying for them. We have to have that kind of relationship with her for whatever it is that God is calling us to do so that we can be new acts of the apostles in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth, but it's only going to be by the Holy Spirit, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So, um, to ask and invite every day the Holy Spirit to overshadow my plans, burn out anything that is not of you, Lord, illuminate everything that is of you, bring the power of God down so that my feet can move where you want me to go, 
shut me down if it's not of you, expose imposters by the power of the Holy Spirit, any invitation that is uh, a fraud, shut it down. The Holy Spirit can do all those things. About what? It's like birth in me, um, like conceive in me something out of nothing. Like, yeah, yeah, bring, you're, yeah that's that, the yeah. power of God brought the Son of God. Yeah. So it wasn't even on her radar. Like right. she just made herself a willing vessel. Yeah. Are there, another question? Oh, wait, down here and then you, Miguel. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yes. I still do sometimes. How do you yeah. keep it? How do you keep that innocence as um, much as you can? God. I mean, prayer, God, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. So I, I think it's not just me working in tele I mean, all of us out in the world, we could be in the supermarket. We could be anywhere exposed to anything. In our own homes, the TV comes on, and what are the images that we're looking at? Blood of Jesus blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus can burn out even the memory of these things. I needed a lot of healing coming from the sex abuse scandal, um, and I didn't even realize, how about that? I didn't even realize how much healing, I didn't even realize how, um, I think one of the leaders was talking about the walking wounded. I might have been that. I was probably that, walking wounded, thinking that I had it going on, but inside was this dying soul. And you know, God provided a place of healing for me, an encounter for me, and that was in the home of Matilde and Emily, and God rest her soul. She passed last year. These women were radical disciples of the Lord who taught me uh, a whole school of the Holy Spirit. I had a lot of training when I was young. I had a hard time bridging my life of faith with the mainstream world. I had a, a male spiritual director at that time who would tell me, you know, go in the bathroom and, and be praying or be praying under your tongue. Like God didn't give you this gift of prayer and praise to just go in and come out and then pray on Sunday or Saturday. You have to be praying all through. And so it was one level for me. Florida became like PhD with these women. And you know, God knew what I needed for, for here, for the war that I would be fighting here, but also for the future where he was taking me. And so we can never be really done with our training. You're gonna graduate from this school of encounter, but guess what? You're gonna to have to keep going the next level and the next level and the next level. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good point. Like, I feel like kind of um, coming from a similar background, just that the, the teachings of the church have always been here, but for whatever reason, it just, it hasn't really been expressed in a way where the laity can really grasp and understand like what we're supposed to do with the gifts and like what does it mean to walk through fire like Daniel did, you know, like and um, for so long we've just been sort of thinking, well, if I just come to, on Sunday Mass, that's going to be enough and prayer is enough. And it is. Prayer is so, prayer is like the first place, but we have to understand how to partner with the prayer, which is why we're so blessed, um, the same bishop that you were praying for, right? And while you were here transforming and learning how to walk in your time, we're still here in the diocese and he's opened the gateway for us to come with encounter. Mm -hmm. And so now we do have a formalized way where we can understand the full teachings of the Catholic Church. We can understand what the saints were saying, how they walked through the fire, and we can apply that today. And so many of you here are students from the school, so I know you already know that, but Alexis is right. When you graduate, that's like now your next level. You know, now you're in the fire with her, and she may have learned in a different school of encounter, but now we're all in that same level of faith and fire, and we have to learn how to partner with each other, minister to each other when we're falling behind, and um, be able to share in whatever context God is calling you. So um, what a gift it is to just have you here today to just be able to talk like this. I know Miguel's got a question. We're going to, we'll take one more question from Miguel. And then I'd love if, um, if you might be able to just kind of pray over the students and anyone else you might like to. But Miguel, what's your question? What's her da daily prayer life look like? Yeah. 
Yep. Mass as often as possible. As often as possible. Adoration. Honestly, adoration in the Eucharist have always been central to my life from the time I was very young. My mom made me go to the Holy Triduum when I was about 14 or maybe 13, and I fought her. I wanted to go to an under-21 club. I didn't get it. And that night, God did a miracle in my life where he revealed himself to me in the Blessed Sacrament. And so from that point, it became central to my life. I mean, we were trying to get to Mass even as a high school student on a daily basis. My dad wasn't Catholic yet. He's a Jewish convert now. And it was disruptive because we wanted to be wherever God was. Um, and so college, same thing, daily Mass as often as possible. And when I was weak, the priest would call and say, can you come lecture? You know, like God will always provide a way for you to do what you need to do to fulfill what God wants you to do. And now it's the same. Um, I had a great blessing in TV days. I couldn't get to daily mass because of my schedule. It was very erratic. You know, 7 a.m. start, sometimes like a plane would crash. We would be there for days and never go home. You know, all kinds of crazy things. But I lived strategically in a place where there was a a parish with a prophetic priest who had the monstrance exposed uh, every night till midnight. So if I got home at 10 or 11 or 12, I would be there on the floor. Even if I was dead asleep, I would let God surgically do what he needed to do in my life. Um, young seminarians uh, and priests that are from Poland and Ethiopia and everywhere have become my best friends. Like when we are near to God, God provides you not only himself, but his disciples. I'm so grateful to have such holy priests and religious sisters in my life and lay women like Mathilde, who's my true spiritual mother. Um, so mass is critical every day. Um, I remember a point during the pandemic, before the pandemic, I'll just share this story. Mathilde was praying with me and I go to adoration very frequently but not like every day at that time. I was going every day before I moved to LA because it was becoming very intense how God was about to move me. I had this sense, and so I was going every day to hear from him. And then when I got to LA, I got busy in my life. I mean, I would go to mass as often as possible, adoration like once a week. We had so many adoration chapels in LA. Then there was a certain point, I'll never forget this, it was like February 2020. The pandemic hadn't hit yet. Matilda would call me and say, the Lord shows me you need to be in adoration chapel every day. And I would say, I'm not a nun. Like, every day? Like, I love Jesus, but every day? Like, it's busy. My job is busy. She was very firm with me. And every day she'd say, have you been to the chapel today? And I'd be like, uh, I'm on my way now. You know? Like, I mean, we can be still children even when we know, right? And she was very firm with me. And I was obedient. Even when I struggle, I will say this, when I struggle and wrestle with what God's asking, in the end, I will do what he's asking because I really don't want to upset God. Like, I don't want to be disobedient to him. If he's really asking me, even though it seems weird, I want to do his will. So I'm going to this adoration chapel. I'm going to weird adoration chapels that I hadn't been before because I'm like, Matilda's on my butt. I better get to the adoration chapel. I don't know what's going on. Well, what was going on was pandemic hit, and we were having Jesus ripped right out of our lives. So God was a step ahead saying to me, the mercy of God, who am I that the mercy of God would speak through Matilda and say, you better get to adoration. You better get to adoration. You better get to adoration like a John the Baptist. And I'm like, okay, Lord, God was so merciful ahead of time. He wanted to give himself to me to fill me when we would have nothing. We better listen when God speaks. That's the lesson. That's the lesson. So adoration as often as possible to the point where I feel so dry if I only go once a week to adoration. I'm so blessed in Massachusetts, the parish that I'm in right now, a young 30-something priest. He is so Eucharistic. We have mass three nights a week in the evening, three nights in the morning, and after every mass, he has about two to three hours of adoration and confession you can't miss. And so, and I know about Palm Beach, you have 6 a.m., you have 7 a.m., you have 8 a.m., you have noon, you have 5.30, you have a lot here. So there's no reason for anyone to be missing here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So. And then praying all day, like literally, just spontaneous and worship.
And I think that's like what we've seen through the, um, the teachings in the prophetic quarter too, is that you know, we, yes, we can hear God anywhere. You can hear him anywhere, anytime you want to pray. But there is something special about being in front of him, being intentional, being in his presence. And I've shared with all my students, they already know this, but like the times I've heard him the most clearly is in front of adoration. Um, that's when I'm really seeking a word, or even when I'm just going and I'm just going to drop by, like St. Jude has that 24-hour adoration chapel. Sometimes they'll just drop in because we're in the area, and I'm, like, always surprised, even 10 minutes with him, and I come out with, like, oh, yeah, that's a great thought, Lord. Like, and I wouldn't have had that if I'd have gone and got the coffee and a donut instead, you know? So learning how to make good choices in your piety is so important, but but for, for what Alexis was saying, I mean, we, we are being given God's mercy in this hour in so many ways through each other, through the promptings of, of his workers all around us. And we just, it's not that we can't hear him, it's that we need to learn better obedience to it, I think. So um, keep trying to be obedient, right? Miguel's doing that. He's, he's doing very well at that. That was a good question. All right, any last question? Any more? I know I said Miguel, but just checking. Okay, so I think what I would love to do right now, um, because we talk a lot about impartation with our students, and and for our guests tonight, you might little you might learn a little bit about when you are um, blessed with with someone like Alexis, who's walked through the fire or walked through something that's different from you. What we teach and what the church shares is that we can actually receive an impartation of grace from the people who come and visit us. So Paul talks about this in the scriptures a lot, like I wish I was there in, your, in person to impart to you some spiritual grace. He's not just hoping to like give you a prayer. Like he literally believed that there is a grace that comes on, um, on us in our speaking and in the life that we've, we've walked with Christ that can be imparted to others who are willing to receive it. So absolutely, yeah, Matilda, please come down. If you, if you would like to, you are invited down to do this with Alexis, because I know, yes, please. Matilda's my covering. Every good grace that, uh, every door that I've walked through, Matilda's been behind me and with Jesus as a, a voice in the wilderness. And so she's going to, she's going to pray with us because I don't do anything without her <laughs> and Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Good. Good to honor. Yeah. Thank you. We honor you. So I'm, I'm going to have, um, let's have uh, our students for sure. You guys don't want to miss out on this. I want to invite our guests too, if you would like to receive just an impartation Everybody. from Grace, um, you know, or if you just want to stay where you are, but you want to just stand up. You know, Come forward because yeah. God, God wants to bless everybody here. Yeah. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of what God is going to do for you and through you. So do you want them to kind of group around the altar maybe? Are we going to doing it in a group or one at a time? Or what are we doing? One at a time? What do you think? What do you want? One, one at a time. time. One at a time. All right, why don't we do yeah. a line then? Um, can I have you guys start right here? I'll have you guys go over here. Okay. Um, in front of the altar, if that's all right. Yeah. And um, this might take a few minutes, so maybe I'll have uh, Cindy put on some Is there more chants. Holy Spirit sing to you. Yes. Um, Peter, could I borrow you, both my Peters? <laughs> You have rocks to catch, how about that? Could I implore you to volunteer to just kind of be a spotter um, as people are praying, if, if anyone looks like they need help? Yes, Joseph as well, okay. Cindy, maybe put on the Gregorian chant that we had earlier just as a background, and if you guys don't mind, if you wanna sit while you're waiting, that's fine too. But yeah, we'll go ahead and lower it, Cindy. Yeah. So good, thank you, Jesus.
if there's any year two students that would like to pray with people, I was going to let you guys maybe come over here on this side of the altar. And um, any of our guests tonight or other students, if you, when you're done with uh, receiving impartation from Alexis, you're welcome to come and pray with our students if you need prayer for anything else. So I just wanted to let you know about that. Um, so you're welcome to sit and rest, or if you'd like some more prayer, our students will start to come over here once they've, once they're ready. All right.